Hello, and uh, welcome to the ECHOES World Curlew Day webinar. Uh, I'm so glad that you all could make it. Um, quite a few of you have registered today. Um, this is the first time we're doing a, a World Curlew Day webinar, so we didn't really know what to expect, but um, I'm really pleased that word got out and that you're all here. My name is Annika Faircloth, and I'm the Stakeholder Engagement Officer for the ECHOES project. I work for uh, GeoSmart Decisions, which is um, one of the ECHOES partners. Uh, we're based in Mid Wales, quite close to the Dovey Estuary, where some of ECHOES research is taking place. And it's the Dovey Estuary that you can see here behind me in the background. Now, we're all here uh, because of our fascination with the curlew. It's a very popular bird, not least because of its stunning bill and its evocative call. As many of you probably know, it's in serious decline. In Wales, it has declined by as much as 80% uh, in the past 40 years, and in Southern Ireland by as much as 90%. The ECHOES project is studying populations of overwintering curlew along the Irish Sea coastlines, and you will hear all of the details shortly. Before we start with the presentations, just a few housekeeping matters. Um, the webinar is being recorded. It will be available on the website later. We have a hashtag, so if you're tweeting about being here today, please use Echoes Proj Live in your tweet. Uh, you will see that there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. We will run a Q&A after all the presentations, but feel free to type in your questions anytime. Our panelists will then have a chance to um, prepare some very clever answers. Um, all the presentations are pre-recorded, so you will find that the sound quality varies a bit. Uh, so um, please be prepared to adjust that on your computers. After the webinar, we will send you a feedback form and it would be great if you could fill that in for us. The chat will be switched off throughout and the, your videos will be switched off as well throughout. Now we have scheduled this webinar for an hour and a half, but we might finish a little bit sooner. It depends on the Q&A. Uh, <clears throat> so these are our speakers today. We've got Mick Green, who's coordinating our surveys on the Dovey Estuary and surrounding habitats. We have Rachel Taylor, who's coordinating our bird tracking activities in Ireland and Wales. Catherine Bowgen, who's analysing our tracking data from tagging projects and population modelling. And Walter Camaro, who's part of the habitat and land cover mapping team. And Rachel and Catherine and Walter will be answering your questions in the Q&A later. And it doesn't end with that. Uh, we also have, um, we will also announce the winners of our Draw a Curlew competition. And last but not least, we will introduce you to Maeve Niviagli, who's an Irish musician who kindly has offered us to play her song, The Curlew's Call. Now that's worth waiting for. Before we start with the presentations, I thought we better have a quick introduction to what the ECHOES project actually is about. It's not all about the curlew. In this video, ECHOES project manager, Kroina Hodges, will share some insights with you. Hello, Paub. A chroiso evening, Heveliniad and Project Echoes. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to my presentation about the Echoes Project. I'm Crona Hodges, and I'm based out of my home office here in Abergenolwyn in Gwynedd. I'm project manager on Echoes, a project about the effect of climate change on bird habitats around the Irish Sea. Moving on to my next slide. In this brief presentation, I will talk about the project funding, give an overview of the project, present some of our progress to date and plans for the future, and end with a few slides about how to get in touch with us as a project. It lists the five project partners. Aberystwyth University uh, are our lead partner, and you'll find more information on each of the other partners and their roles on the project on our website, echoesproj.eu, shown here on the next slide. Moving on again, stakeholders in the project include the organisations shown here, as well as smaller organisations such as schools and conservation and nature and wildlife organisations interested in issues that affect the coast. We're always looking for additional interested groups or organisations who might want to work with us on awareness raising campaigns. 
and those who might be interested in helping us to understand the existing views on how climate change might impact coastal environments. So what was the idea behind the project? You'll see from the illustrations here on the next slide that we recognise there are some question marks around exactly how climate change impacts the Irish Sea coast, both now and in the future. The ECHOES project plans to work closely with land users and land managers and those charged with conservation and habitat protection along the coast to understand what information and what tools might help to make their work feel more informed. We're also looking specifically at the current behaviour of overwintering curlew and Greenland white-fronted geese and using the data that we collect to help inform how the coastal habitats that they frequent can be best managed for their benefit and ultimately their survival, given they are both declining in alarming numbers. As the next slide shows, the operation objective is all about increasing levels of knowledge of adaptation to climate change. We've added four related objectives to this, illustrated here on the next slide, which include raising awareness of climate change, specifically through our studies within coastal habitats, gathering evidence to increase that knowledge related to green and white fronted geese and curlew, and lastly, to develop a platform and tools that assist policymakers, coastal managers and users of the coastal environment that focus on understanding the potential impacts of climate change along the coast. In terms of progress to date, on the next slide, I have listed some of the activities that have begun in earnest. We've begun development work on the platform, engaging with potential users and gathering user requirements that will steer and inform that development work. We've carried out species distribution modelling, the ringing and tagging of birds on the Welsh coast, collected goose faecal matter so that we can carry out DNA analysis on this, and that's on samples from both Wales and Ireland. We've carried out analysis using satellite Earth observation data to create habitat maps using imagery of the Irish coast, and we've carried out engagement work with schools in Wales. I've listed three points here on the next slide about future work and the first two you'll see heavily involve engagement with both potential users of the tools that we're developing and also with those interested in hearing more about the impacts of climate change on coastal bird habitats or indeed those who would be interested in collaborating on that sort of outreach. The final few slides are about how to keep in touch. I mentioned the website earlier. There's information on there in the form of our blogs, one of which is about our illustrator Laura pictured here. On the next slide, you'll see you can subscribe to our newsletter. And lastly, of course, you can keep in touch with us via social media. Here is our Twitter handle. And lastly, you'll see we have a Facebook page and a group. So please do join if you're interested and if you're on Facebook. So that's it from me for now. Thank you very much for watching. Diolch Vaur. OK, thanks for that, Krona. Uh, now, a few weeks ago, I met up with Mick Green, who coordinates the Curlew surveys on the Dovey Estuary, to hear him talk about the Curlew and his work with the ECHOES project. Uh, there's a bit of a breeze in this video, so I uh, suggest you turn up the volume on your computers. We're here on the Dovey Estuary, which is the, the Welsh section of the ECHOES project. The estuary behind me is designated as a special protection area and a special area of conservation under European legislation. It's also a national nature reserve and a United Nations biosphere site, which tells you some of the importance of the area with all those designations. It has about 800 curlew most winters wintering on the area, feeding on the mudflats behind me and sometimes on the fields adjacent to the estuary. We know the numbers of curlew because they're counted monthly by the RSPB who have a reserve at the top of the estuary and they monitor the area very closely. The ECHOES project has also been monitoring the curlew and looking at where they're feeding and as part of those studies we've been catching some and putting individual colourings on so we can recognise individual birds and see where they move around the estuary. We can also see where they move after they leave the estuary and one of our birds from here has already been seen inland in Wales moving east towards its breeding grounds. By chance also we've had a German bird wintering here. This was satellite tags on breeding grounds in central Germany. It migrated here last June, spent all the winter here and left a couple of weeks ago to go back to Germany. The satellite position mean we know where it is every day 
and it's been sitting more or less in the middle of the estuary right behind me feeding on the sand flats even during the medium tides it stays there in the water waiting for the tides to drop down so it can start feeding again obviously the change in sea level that echoes is looking at modeling could have a profound effect on these birds because they like to spend most of their time on the safety of the open estuary where their food supply worms and other invertebrates are and if the sea level rises we'll be losing a lot of those mud flats it means they won't be exposed at low tides and the birds won't have anywhere to feed so it's important to know where the mud flats are likely to lose can we recreate them somewhere else can we move sea walls back so we can look at managing the habitats to make sure there's still areas for curlew to feed all the year round. Curlew also used to breed near here on a site called Korsvachno or Borthbog which is a large um, peat area to my left. They don't breed there anymore and we're not really sure why but that's part of the general decline of waders uh, and especially curlew which have declined about 80% across Wales and even more in Southern Ireland. So we need to know why that is and is it because they're not feeding so well in the winter and that is also part of our studies here. All right, um, many thanks for that Mick. <clears throat> As you can hear, Mick knows everything there is to know about curlew. He's currently um, out surveying breeding curlew in Montgomeryshire so he won't be partaking in the Q&A later. Uh, but He's more than happy to answer questions via email if you email us on info at echoesproj.eu. Now the next speaker is Rachel Taylor from BTO Cymru. Uh, Rachel will tell us, she will give us a, a bit more of a, a, an in-depth introduction to overwintering curlew and whether, uh, whether it could adapt to coastal squeeze. Hello, my name is Rachel Taylor. I'm the Senior Ecologist for the British Trust for Ornithology in Wales, and I'm a partner in the ECHOES project. And I'm, oh, sorry, that was me. I'm actually responsible for the tagging and tracking work that ECHOES is doing um, in support of investigating climate change effects around the Irish Sea. And today, because today is World Curlew Day, I'm focusing on curlew. And the question really that ECHOES is trying to address, which is whether curlew can adapt to coastal squeeze. And this is a critical question, actually, and you'll find out why. So I'm going to look today at an overview of what ECHOES is trying to do with curlew. But more importantly than that, how we're going about it. So first of all, I think it's important to recognise that curlew are declining across almost all of their global range. This is a species under real pressure. Um, we know something about why they're declining and what processes are driving it, but I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. I'm also going to give you an idea of why the Irish Sea is so important to this species. So first of all, the Eurasian curlew is Britain's largest wading bird. They really are very large. Their body size is about the same as a wood pigeon, so they're you know, chunky things. But added to that, it has this tremendous long curved bill and long legs. And those are adaptations to its primarily to its winter habitat. I mentioned that they're declining. The map here shows the winter distribution of the species in the UK and Ireland. U IUCN lists the species as, as near threatened, globally near threatened. Um, in Europe, they're listed as vulnerable, um, and that's because they're declining so rapidly, documented declines of 30 to 50 percent in recent times. In the UK, they're listed and red listed, which is a higher classification. And in the UK, critically, we support about a third of the European breeding population, a third. And even in winter, the UK holds more than a quarter of the, the entire global population of this species. So we are the centre of the world for this species. And the UK and Ireland, of course, are right in the centre of this. But we have to ask ourselves why a species with such a broad distribution across Eurasia is so focused on the UK and Ireland. And there are really clear reasons for that. So 
we can see this is information from the, the global migration project during um, migration. In June, Curlew in Europe um, are distributed, obviously, in the UK and Ireland, um, near coastal areas and uh, the middle of Europe and up into Scandinavia. But by December, the population has contracted. It's migrated into the UK. It's also travelled south, so there are more birds on the coast of France. Um, some Curlew go down off into uh, North Africa, parts of the Caribbean. So that globally, the population is occupying a much smaller area. We don't fully understand who goes where. Broadly speaking, individuals travel to the west and to the south for the winter. But the reason that they come to the UK is actually because of two things. First of all, we're on the westerly coast of Europe in a western airflow. And even more importantly than that, the winter climate in the UK is warm because of the Gulf Stream. So we're in this northerly flowing stream of water as part of one of the major global um, ocean circulations. Without the Gulf Stream, in winter, UK's temperatures would look like Newfoundland. With the Gulf Stream, we seldom freeze. The sea very, very rarely freezes. So it's mild. And on top of that, we have enormous tidal amplitudes. We have the, some of the biggest tides in the world. And that twice a day exposes huge areas of intertidal mudflats and salt marshes, which are full of food. They're buffets for some of these species. So it's mild, there's lots of food. That's why the birds are coming here. That's why it's so critical that we pay attention to conservation in the UK and Ireland. But we don't know enough about those processes. We don't know how many of the birds wintering here in Wales and in Ireland are actually UK breeding birds, perhaps from Scotland. How many of them are continental breeding birds? How many of them are from even further north in Scandinavia? One thing we do know is that our coastlines are under pressure. This is a graphic explaining the term coastal squeeze. And what's happening here is that processes are changing in the marine environment, sea levels rising, sea temperature is changing, the Gulf Stream is actually getting weaker. And that's pushing habitats towards the land. It's eroding land. Um, it's changing tidal cover. And at the same time, we have human mediated processes on the landward side pushing outwards. And those processes might be sea defences for agriculture or even for protecting our towns and cities. It might be the shape of the land, the shape of the profile of the land. North Wales, for example, is quite rocky, so there's not very much room between the encroaching sea and the land for these intertidal areas to exist. And we have to remember that coastal areas are also critical to humans. So most of the global curlew population in winter is on the coast in these intertidal areas. But 41% of the EU human population lives in coastal areas. And at the same time, we have these, uh, we, we have developmental processes. People want to build new houses. They want to defend the areas that they have. We're under pressure to improve and maintain agricultural production to support the human population. We have uh, marine um, exploitation, things like shell fisheries human recreation, and against this we have sea level rise. And in the middle, in the winter, there are the curlew. And something else that we know about curlew is that they adapt very slowly to change. They are incredibly site faithful. They winter in the same place, they use the migration, the same migration routes, they breed in the same places. They're not able to look into the future and adapt. That's the role that human beings need to take. But even to me, and I'm a great fan of curlew, they all look more or less the same. Every individual curlew is richly marked in brown and cream. They have a decurved bill. Females are a little bigger than males. The bird on the, um, on the right in these photos is a female and the bird on the left is male. But looking at curlew in a field, 
we can't tell whether that bird is from Scandinavia or Scotland. In order to make them identifiable, in order to understand the seasonal turnover, so who moves to where, we put colour marks on them. You can see the bird on the right here is wearing colourings on its legs, and that identifies it as an individual without somebody having to catch it. And it's quite important, if we want to look at how birds are using a landscape, we need two things. First of all, we need to understand individual movements. There might be a flock of curlew on a piece of coastline on the beach at high tide, and there also might be a small number of birds at low tide. But until I can identify the individual, I don't know whether it's the same birds staying there or whether they're moving away and another group of birds is coming in. We're also, if we're only using visual information, we're also restricted to the times of day and the types of weather when you can see curly. And that means we have an observer present, which might disturb the way that the birds behave, and it's only in daylight. And to compensate for that and to give us really good information about what the birds are doing so that we can try and understand why, we use tags. You can see the bird on the left here has a little satellite tag which is actually glued onto its back in between its shoulder blades. And that tag stores a location for the bird every 15 minutes, 24 seven, every day of the week, night and day, that little tag will be recording where that bird was. And when we download that information, we get a clear picture of where the bird has been all the time, whether somebody was looking at it or not. And that gives us completely unbiased information about how the world looks to a curlew. The critical thing about that for echoes is that the birds can now tell us what's important to them. They tell us what habitats they select from, and we can then we can later go back to those places using the tag data to tell us where the bird has been and we can understand something about what that habitat is, what the invertebrate profile looks like, what type of soil, what type of vegetation the birds choose. And we can use that understanding to build management plans, habitat management plans, potentially to either protect areas that are important to the birds that might be under pressure from us or from sea level rise, or alternatively, understand what the birds need so we can provide them with alternatives that might work. What we're looking at here, what echoes can do, is to do something that curly can't do for themselves. We can use their habitat requirements to plan for the future. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, we will have a quick break now. And after that, we will be back with um, Catherine Bowgen, who's also from BTO Cymru. And Catherine will talk about our latest tagging data from Kevney Valley in Wales. In the break, I will play a lovely video about overwintering curlew in Britain by Curlew Action. Uh, and you can obviously watch it on their website later if you haven't got time now. It's about six minutes long, so I think we'll have a six minute break. OK, see you in a bit. Britain's coastline is not only beautiful, it is vital for wintering birds to rest and feed up over the harshest months. We may think our winters are cold, but not compared to the rest of Northern Europe. We welcome hundreds of thousands of wetland birds to our shores every year. Large to small, they gather together bringing life to wet, wild places.
and among them is Europe's largest wading bird, the curlew. Long-legged, long, downward curving bill. It is a specialist of muddy places. It can get to parts other birds can't reach. The tip of its bill is exquisitely sensitive. It can find food deep beneath its feet. Its calls fill the air. And inland from the coast, the coastal fields and marshes are also rich in feeding opportunities. Curlews gather. Some will be from Europe, some locals. They badly need these wintering sites. Their numbers are declining so rapidly. Britain has lost half of its population in just 20 years. Right across Europe, these wild songsters are disappearing. With so many changes in the landscape, and so many pressures, the curlews are being forced out. Once a safe haven, our coastlines are changing. Year on year, the problems are building and intensifying. Our climate is getting stormier and wetter, making a hard season even harder. flooded fields become too wet for foraging. It is often a struggle for wild creatures to find their space. Try and carry on as they always have, as the world around them changes. But natural rhythms are disrupted by light and sound. Wide open coastal spaces are always in high demand, and the pressure of development is ever increasing. an urgent decision to make. If we want the winter air filled with the calls of water birds, and the curlew song to inspire us into the future, we have to protect and cherish the rich coastlines of Britain.
Right, I think, I think I'm on again. Hi there, welcome back. I hope you can hear me. I um, hope you've had uh, had some time to have a cup of tea and stock up on some biscuits. Uh, uh, here's Catherine Bowden now, and she will present the latest data from the tagged curlews in Kefni. Oops, sorry. Hello everyone, my name is Catherine Bowden. I'm a research ecologist with British Trust for Ornithology in the Cymru office and I'm also part of the ECHOES team as a research analyst looking at the tracking data that comes back from our various birds in the study. Today I'm going to be telling you a bit of a story about how we're going to join the dots to tell us a bit of a tale about how the birds are wandering around our coastline during the winter. So you will already know a little bit more about this but we're tracking them to understand the effect of climate change on bird habitats around the Irish Sea and we're doing this through attaching blue mounted GPS tags to Kermley's backs. And we expect to see a kind of movement around the estuaries and the nearby fields to where we know that they are winter from other observations and historic observations. But also we're expecting to see a few focal areas that are frequently revisited, plus understanding a few of their day and night movements. Now, you probably have already heard a little bit about how we're catching curlew, and you know that there's going to be unique identifiers such as a ring and colour ring combinations. But also we're mounting these GPS devices and as you know they're glue mounted onto the backs they'll fall off when the feathers molt but they provide us with a whole range of data that we can actually have a bit of fun with to understand where they're going. Now we do both observations to understand where the birds are from our tagging data but mainly we're also downloading the data onto these base stations as you can see in the bottom right and what happens is the data gets downloaded um, when their birds are within range and we are able to process all of the information about how many satellites were attached at what time. In this screen in the bottom left, this is sort of kind of what I see when I'm processing the data. And then we get after them all the latitude and longitudes. And very quickly, Google Earth can show us exactly where they've been, such as in this middle map with all the yellow dots on. When we go out, we often see them far in the distance. And I promise you in this top right, there were some geese and curlew in here. <laughs> But the important thing is that we're able to take this data and take us on a little bit of a journey to see where the birds have been. So here is all of the movements we got from the tagging this winter. So there were six birds that we tagged and each one of them has got different colour and all the lines are running through. And you can see they're really heavily focused on this bottom left hand corner. There was one bird that we got right to the very end of the season before the data switched to a different download schedule. We don't track them quite as fast over the summer months as they go on migration for breeding seasons, but most of them are focused in this bottom area. And the amazing thing is we're able to then look at individual differences, male and female differences, day and night, week of the year, and we can take this all forward and understanding a bit more about their habitat preferences, a little bit able to take us onto a journey of what we can understand about how they're using our landscape. So... To start, I'm going to give you a whole range of these different things to show you quite what we found. It's still the early stages. The data only came in at the end of March for the final lot. So here's one bird. And you can see very focused for this week that we've got the data showing on this corner a bit of the estuary. Whereas another one at the same time for exactly the same week, still using the estuary as a focal spot, but going all the way inland um, in two different directions. One of them into the northeast follows along the valley, which makes sense as sort of the estuary is following up there into the river and water courseways. But it also went right over a, a, um, a ridge line into this other area. Why did it go there? And the fact it took such a direct route. So we know curlews can fly quite fast, but these are 15 minutes intervals, these points. So really interesting to understand. And then when you put them over the top of each other, such as here, I've overlaid three different individuals for a week. You can see that they're still focal areas of where they're going, but they're focal areas both um, inland and in other places. So they're using similar areas. So we know these are hot spots for the birds of interest. We can then take this on a little bit further and analyze it into a home range, which shows us the wider areas because 15 minute intervals tells us point data, but we want to know what are the wider areas they might possibly be using. And you can see from all of the individuals that there still was a very focal area on the estuary, plus a bit further up the valley, that this hotspot inland was still considered important enough for the widest reach of our data sets. So that's all of the data together, but we know there must be some smaller differences. So we looked at day and night, and you can see that actually the blue day pots, spots 
are slightly differently located from the nighttime. And all those inland sites, they're actually nighttime locations. Splitting it down for a single week for a few individuals, we can see that the daytime on the left was all focused towards the estuary and the fields nearby. Whilst nighttime, they were actually going quite far inland some days to be able to actually spend the night there. So they would have been foraging as well, but the fact that they were further away, really interesting in how they're differentiating their habitat use. Showing the more sort of bulbous viewpoint, we can see again that there's a focus in this top right and inland for the nighttime use. So that was more nighttime use they were going inland for. So very different from what we see from the daytime habitat. Look about male and females. So on curly, we can actually identify males and females from the bill lengths. So females have much longer than the males. And you can see that the females in blue were doing very similar things to the males. So actually during the winter, there wasn't as much difference as we sometimes see during breeding months. Very good to know that actually in some cases that they are overlapping. So slightly different strategies don't have to be used when both of them are following the same area. But again, when splitting it down to the home ranges, so the focal areas, this male area, it turns out that that inland was some males that were focusing hard on it. We do know females visited it as well, but it was considered more important for the male data. Interesting, isn't it? So what can we do with all the rest of this data? So we can investigate which habitats or areas are most important to Curly, and then we can take an understanding of what food might be on this site from the um, foraging availability, and also um, in some cases, we can study the invertebrates that might be there as well and then take it forward and understanding how much of these areas should be protected and what might be available for the birds. It's not necessarily part of our project immediately, but we're gonna help inform this sort of information. And I'm pleased to say tagging will continue. So we'll get more tags deployed next winter with data rich websites to help managers and planners. And we're gonna be looking at more by bird migration routes around the Irish Sea through color marking. So our tags for the curly will fall off when they change their molt. Um, and it means that we won't be able to always pick up the data that's going past, but we are hoping that we'll be able to get views from people like yourself who are watching and finding the colour marks on either side of the Irish Sea. So thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, I'm going to be happy to take them at the end, or you can email me and have a look out for some of the colourings. In the top left and top right, I've got some examples of some of the legs you might see with the colouring. Thank you very much. All right, uh, many thanks for that, Catherine. Uh, Catherine will join us in the Q&A session shortly, so remember to have your questions handy for that. Uh, we have one more presenter, and that's Walter Camaro from University College Cork. And as I said previously, Walter is working with the habitat mapping side of things. Um, now, it's easy to give the impression that ECHOES is all about studying the birds in the field. <clears throat> But as uh, project manager Krona Hodges mentioned earlier, a big part of the ECHOES project is about developing web-based tools. Now, these tools will help site managers, and farmers and owners of coastal land to identify what habitats they have on their site and what actions they can take to preserve these habitats for the future. Some of our field data will feed into these tools along with other open source data sets and climate change projections. Uh, and you can find out more about this on our website, obviously. Um, so here is Walter now presenting Curlew Habitats, a view from space. Hello, my name is Walter Camaro and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University College Core and Murray Center. I am part of the ECUS project. I am in chair of the habitat mapping uh, work package and on the climate prediction work package. And I'm going to give you a tell about Curlew Habitats and how we can use the air observation sources and tools to mapping and to understand the distribution of different curlew habitats. When we are studying the curlews and their movements or their patterns, it's essential to understand the relationship between them and the natural environment. A way to understand this relation is to study the habitats or the key habitats in which curlew meet all their necessities. What kind of necessities like food, weather, shelter, and the areas where they decide to go to nesting. And in addition, we have to consider that the curlew are migratory birds and they are changing the habitat seasonally, seeking to meet their, their necessities. And this is important because we need to understand why, are, why they are going to a particular areas during a particular season, that, but why, for example, they are coming to the iris 
uh, coastlines during the winter, for example. There are several methodologies to study the key habitats. In the ECOS project, we are applying some of them to analyze the characteristics and dynamics of these habitats along the IDC coastline. And these areas are important because the, there is a recurring presence of Eurasian colleus, in particular in wetlands and in, in, in less quantities in floodplains and boglands. As part of our activities, uh, Regarding the Corleo habitats, we are trying to understand the distribution and the location of these habitats, these key habitats in the Irish Sea, uh, using open source air observation imagery. Uh, we are mainly using Sentinel-2 imagery that are generated by the European Space Agency under the Copernicus program. These images are like having a 10 meters um, resolution and we can have uh, an image each three or four days during the year. And the only restraint or the only like complex situation is that we need like images that are glue free. And this is a kind of challenge for, for the development of the project or the development of the, of the uh, habitat analysis. The idea is to generate habitat and land cover maps and the decision to use air observation data sets is because this kind of information allows us to access large and inaccessible areas that are really hard to, to reach when you are working in the field. Uh, use a technology that allows to us to have information during different times of the year without disturbing the Carlius or the different species in the field and have the possibility to have a seasonal monitoring because uh, when we are talking about habitats, we are normally talking about vegetations and different uh, field conditions that are changing during the year that uh, this information is important because we need to understand why the colliers, for example, are coming during the winter time or during the different times of the year to a particular areas. Then, for example, we have the Dobby area. This is an area of interest because there is a recurrent presence of uh, Corleo during the winter. And we have a, a kind of an, an image, for example, for each one of the seasons. Then you, you can see the, the winter time in the left, the left one image, or you can see that image in April that is corresponding almost to an, an spring time, or, or we have a summer or an autumn image too. And uh, in addition, we have uh, a couple of images that are, are getting the, the moment of low tides and you see the, the, the image in the middle of in the spring and the, and the summer, the, the image were created in property in the low tide period and we have the estuary with our water and we have the other two images with the water and it's really interesting because we have the different conditions of, 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 the, of, of, the, of the area during the year and with this and with, uh, with the, the help of a tool and uh, algorithms that we are developing, we can extract the different classes that have, uh, first of all, a similar uh, behavior during the year. They have the, a particular chief during the year. Um, they have a similar condition, uh, special condition. Then, for example, you see the, the right side uh, area that have no like particular change during the year, then we, we can say that that could be like kind of forest areas or we can see there is like a kind of a triangular in the left side uh, below to the history that could be like a, a, a pet bog or a bottom area that have similar behavior during the year. Then in base of this and, uh, and a kind of a tool or a kind of algorithms and the analysis of these uh, images, we can have a kind of a different kind of land cover or habitat classes. Then based on the information and in the process that I explained to you before, we can obtain this kind of land cover or this kind of classification map generated through this processing of air observation. This is a useful and, um, and a beautiful map full of colors, but the thing is that this map is incomplete. And why this map is incomplete? Because we don't have the information or we don't have the labels of this kind of classes and we don't know what, what are kind of a, a vegetation, for example, we have in this kind of a different colors. Then for example, we don't know if this 
uh, area is a salmarch that maybe is an important area for the curlew and is, a, is an area maybe on the curlew are going to, to find food or we don't know if this is a grassland or what kind of grassland is this or if this is a kind of important area where the grassland is going, for example, to nesting or to, to sleep, for example, we don't know this. And we don't know if this area is, for example, a bogland. Then we need some additional process to complete or to add like kind of label or key information to this kind of uh, map that we generate through the air observation processing. To complete this information, to complete the air observation information and all the process that we generate based on only the air observation sources, we need to apply the kind of interdisciplinary approach that is based on a cooperation between the air observation team for say something like the observation team or group and the field survives or vegetation expert group that are going to give us the information to add the content or the key uh, data to the land cover or habitat map that we generate through the air observation. Then we have the air observations um, maps that we generate only making the analysis of the different patterns or uh, of the of the different chief during the year for and we, we have this kind of classes with all, with all labels then we can give the labels of the important information using the interdisciplinary approach with the concepts of, of the vegetation of the people that know the areas or with vegetation survives the people that go into the area and confer what kind of classes we have and with this we can have labels or we can have information and why we can have the kind of, of vegetation species in the areas and finally, we can make a relationship between this kind of maps with the complete information with the curlew uh, presence in, in the areas. Then, for example, we can we have this curlew data that is generated through tagging curlews in, in different areas. And with this information, we can uh, identify the habitats where the curlew are, have presence. And we can define this like a key habitats and see if uh, the curlew have, have been a, a particular uh, relation with this kind of habitats. And this is useful, for example, to understand and to support a uh, species distribution model that is uh, an essential tool to understand the behavior and, and to understand the kind of relation between the curlew and the natural environment. Then in conclusion, the study of key habitat is essential for to understand the relation between curlew and natural environments. It's really important to see how the curlews are moving between the habitats in different periods of the year. The air observation is really useful to understand and to have an idea about the distribution of the location of these key habitats. And this is because we can access to areas that are really hard to reach uh, during the study field survives and we can access to these areas in any moment of the year and we can uh, uh, access to these areas without disturb the, the, the curlew and the different species in, in the area. And finally, the air observation is a really useful tool but it's not a standalone tool that needs uh, interdisciplinary cooperation with the field survives and with different experts to generate like a kind of useful and complete information. Many. All right. Okay. Thank you, Walter. Now we're going to move on to our Q&A now. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. <clears throat> and here we have the panelists. Hello. <laughs> You're all muted, by the way. Hello, happy welcome, Hello. everyone. Hello, everybody. Hello. Nice to see you all in person. So, we have a question here uh, saying, not really a question, but just to say that I project manage the Trio Sai Cymru, Cymru ESF. WG funded project at Aberhuni. We work with over 1,500 year nine pupils across Wales. 
We've launched an online digital workshop today called Wading Birds in Wales, focusing specifically on curlews. And we have discussed the work of Echoes of the Echoes project. Oh, that's great. That was from Rachel Keeble. Uh, that's really good news, Rachel. So if, um, if anyone else has any questions, do let us know. Uh, one question for you, Rachel, is about the tagging. How do you catch curlew and is it safe? That's an interesting question. Um, the, there are a number of different methods for catching curlew and they're all quite carefully controlled um, under a system of licensing, but also training. Um, and for this project, because we were working in the winter and we were also aiming to catch curlew in daylight, we used a method called cannon netting, uh, which sounds terrifying, but it's actually been used by wader researchers for about the last 40 years, certainly longer than I've been doing it. Um, and it's a method where you go to a place that's going to be dry and is provides a reasonable landing spot for curlew, but that you know curlew use. Um, and then you, you set a sort of big rectangular net um, which is gathered up and laid on the ground and it's actually powered um, using four big steel um, cannons and projectiles. So essentially metal weights that are attached to the front of the net um, and they're put into cannons and buried at the back of the net and you kind of hide the whole thing. And then you sit and wait and hope for the, for the curlew to arrive. Um, and if the curlew come into the right place, then you can fire the net. And that sort of throws this big rectangular net through the air over the birds and it floats down um, and keeps them from flying away until the team can get to them. And it sounds, well, it, it sounds terrifying, um, but actually it's been used for a very long time and it's been proven in the hands of people who are experienced at doing it to be very, very safe. Um, and as I said, we, we monitor each other and everybody who uses this method is monitored actually by the, the BTO's licensing team and by a, a training structure across the whole of the UK. I think that was a very good answer, Rachel. Um, could you just let us know how you put the tags on? And how long they oh, actually yes. stay on? Um, so that that's a, that's a whole other technology. Um, so one of the things that we're quite concerned about about is to avoid any long term effects of what we're doing on the birds, and that's for um, several reasons. Obviously, the most important one is is simple ethics. It's not appropriate to research a declining endangered species by doing something that would harm it. But more than that, as a scientist it's important that the birds that we are working with are actually behaving normally. So they're not, they're behaving like all curlew do rather than like curlew do who are carrying something around that, that distracts them slightly. Um, and there are small risks associated with anything that involves interacting with the wild bird. So what we're doing with, with echoes is rather than using any permanent or semi-permanent method like putting on a harness, which is something that we might do for long-term migration studies, we actually just super glue the tag to the bird. Um, sounds very simple, um, but curlew molt once a year at the end of the breeding season. And that means that they're not going to be growing and replacing body feathers through the winter. So if we super glue the tag to the bird and we actually glue it to the tag's skin rather than to the feathers, um, it will stay on the bird for up to several months. And because it doesn't move relative to the skin, the curlew ignores it. But once the bird does begin to molt, or if something happens, if the, the tag should snag on something, although we've never seen that, it will just fall off. Um, and then the bird is completely unencumbered and not even carrying a tag. Um, but the tags themselves are actually very light as well. Part of the design um, of the study is to find a means of tracking the birds that is as, as unobtrusive as possible. And these tags weigh about half the weight of a pound coin. So they really are very small and light. 
and we have we've watched birds for hours and hours looking to see whether they respond to the tags and it's interesting that they will walk away on, on release shaking their legs because they've got a, a color ring on and that's an unexpected thing but generally they ignore the tag completely and we never see them interact with it okay that's good news um in <laughs> It is. Um, and just a, a final note, and we've, we've been using this tagging method now for several years, um, and we haven't seen any long term survival impacts either. So birds survive just as well, whether they've been tagged or not. OK, good. We have another question here. Um, we've heard very interesting data about the wintering sites. Please, could you tell us more about improved grassland sites that curlews seem to prefer to nest on and how the farmers can be helped to look, up, look after these nesting sites? Who feels inclined to take that question? I can, um, I can see Catherine smiling. I can, I can have <clears> a bit of a go, but Rachel will have more information. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's that's that's a question that's slightly outside the remit of echoes um bto is also involved in work for the breeding season um and i'd be more than happy to talk about breeding season um, work going forwards and what we're finding out there we're using some very set very similar methods um but echoes actually is focusing on wintering part of the of the species life cycle um, so I think it, it may be more appropriate if, if you can drop me an email, I can tell you about some of the, the summering and breeding work that's happening outside of ECHOES. Okay, great. The only thing I was going to add to that was that from my initial look at the data, so what I presented, so um, I, I don't know if I, I can't remember if I, 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 I muted myself during the, um, the talk, I must say, I'm not very good at listening to myself. Um, the tag data was until the end of March, so it's very recent analysis, so I haven't gone too far, but you can see that during the winter months, as Rachel was saying, they weren't using the improved grassland fields quite as much as we see when they're using them during the breeding season. So still to find out exactly quite how they are interacting it and how that would relate to current farming practices of intensive fields over winter, but definitely something we want to look into. Okay, thanks, Catherine. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, are you able to see significant differences in curly movements and home range around times of spring tides and highest tidal range? So, yes, we imagine we will. I have not put that into my analysis yet. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I've only had a couple of weeks with the full data set. Um, but yes, um, we know from other species um, of waders that are um, based around coastlines um, that they will use different amounts and different proportions of inland compared to coastal areas when they are lacking in area because of high tide sequences. So you can imagine as the tide comes in, there's less foraging area for them to take advantage of, but they will hold on as long as they think it's sensible for their energy requirements so um birds actually it's it's a wonderful term called optimal foraging theory that you can happily google as much as you like but they basically make the best decision for their energy and how much effort it's going to take but if the tide is in then often they will go inland and make use of that so yes one of the plans is to to investigate sort of the distances traveled given tidal ranges um if i can also pick that one up um, it's because I put the tags on, I obviously watch the data coming in with, with bated breath. I get very excited when the first download happens. And um, yes, absolutely, just eyeballing the data, you can see that on, um, on neap tides, the birds spend much less time coming over the seawall in the Kevney Valley. There, there are certainly one or two of them stayed outside the seawall almost all the time, and they only came over on the, the, the tops of spring tides. Um, but that that relationship with um, with water level through the tide cycle is something that we can take forwards into into modeling the impacts of sea level change, because obviously every day, twice a day, the birds are telling us how they respond to changing sea levels. So when we're taking the modeling forwards in the future, and as Catherine said, we've literally we've just finished our first first 
um, field season, we have our first big pile of data to analyze as a whole. That's something that we'll be, we'll be doing in a lot more detail going forward. Okay, great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I have another question here asking, uh, will this continue over many years? Uh, I don't know if uh, if you refer to the ECHOES project as a whole, uh, but in that case, I can say that ECHOES uh, will continue until June 2023. So it's a three and a half year operation in total. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, I have another um, nesting related question here. Am I right in thinking that wind turbines put curlews off nesting? Um, since Catherine hasn't jumped in there, I'll I'll open my mouth again. If you get tired of hearing my voice, do just 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 tell me, Annika. Um, good question, Rachel. Um, as far as one of the problems that we have with wind turbines is that many sites with wind turbines, you see a very strong response from nesting birds locally through the construction phase of the turbine array because there's a lot of disturbance. There are people all over it, there's trucks all over it, there are people backwards and forwards doing maintenance. But the, the disturbance impact of the turbine array after it's completed, when the turbines are running, um, but there are very few people uh, because it goes back to normal management or less, is actually quite different. And wind turbines are a relatively recent occurrence, certainly from the perspective of a curlew that might live 20 or 25 years. So the construction phase certainly is a significant source of disturbance. Once the turbines are in operation, um, it appears to be much less significant, but we don't yet fully have the picture of how much and whether curly return to them because the changes happening associated with wind turbines are also happening at the same time as all sorts of other processes that are changing the distribution and breeding success of curlew. So it's all very much tangled up together. Um, but again, breeding curlew is really outside the remit of the ECHOES project. And Rachel, I'm more than happy to, to have an email from you later. I can send you some references to have a look at. Um, okay, thank you, Rachel. Uh, is predation much of a problem? So I, I can I can change from Rachel's voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so during the winter months, we don't actually know as much about predation in relation to um, birds. If the majority of curly will actually be based on the coastline, as you saw, and so um, we know there are less mammalian predators, in particular, around the coastal areas. Most of the predation issues with um, curly populations tend to be during the breeding season, which is relating to their, um, their chicks when they are small and are vulnerable and unable to get away quite as quickly. During the wintering season, um, definitely birds that are on coastlines, we don't have as many reports of predation occurring, but when they do go inland to um, spend time, we expect that there would be some overlap with um, predators there, but um, this is again something that's still within the current research um, investigations that are going on. But it's a very different wintering to breeding season effects of predation. Thank you, Catherine. Um, right. Um, thank you, Catherine and Rachel. Modeling around this could be really useful in adaptation planning and understanding of function functionally linked land, which can be under considerable, under considerable development and recre recreational pressure. Yes, absolutely, Andrew. That is right at the heart of what we're doing. Um, and it was a surprise to us that Curly were going so far inland, uh, whether, you know, some of them go a long way inland, even on on low tides as opposed to spring tides. So that functional linkage between low lying, in this case, low lying agricultural land, 10 kilometers in land, you know, big distances in land, is actually critical to understanding how land management and coastal management um, can have an impact on curlew. I mean, I wouldn't have been concerned about agricultural land that far inland in winter for curlew until we put these tags on and we, we sat back and said, oh, hang on a minute, Curly were extending our understanding of coastal processes a surprisingly long way inland. 
Um, going forwards, when we can, when we're um, able to do tracking work in Ireland and um, potentially also down on the Dovey Estuary, so in other parts of Wales, we'll be able to understand whether this is a feature of curlew or whether it's a feature of something about the structure and geography of the Kevney Estuary itself. Um, but yes, functional linkages are right where we're at. Great. I um, have another question, and this might have to be the last question. Um, Sue is asking, very interesting, thank you. Uh, what are the plans to use the information to inform decision making by landowners and managers and planning authorities? Does anyone feel inclined to answer that one? I know that um, some of the information that Annika provided and Corona provided is probably the best way to discuss this and the fact that we are providing web based um, uh, data sets that will be able to be interacted with for managers and uh, park reserve managers they'll be able to take the data that so the process data that we will be doing from the tags but also the work that Walter and his colleagues will be doing will be able to be put into an interactive website where people can investigate where there are overlaps between habitat and curlew usage during winter months. Plus also there's a whole range of other um, variables that will be put in relation to climate change. So Rachel mentioned sea level rise. So we there are a lot of models out there that have been produced by uh, worldwide and European based organizations to look into what are the potential effects of or how high sea level might rise. And we can also put that into our modelling as well. And I believe it's going to be going into the website, but Annika might know more or Walter. Walter? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that is part of the one of the one of the part of the project is to include the climate projections. And as we are mapping habitats and we are mapping the curly tax, we are we are going to map like a different kind of climate variables that could affect the habitats of different species. And that is one of the keys or the objectives of this project to see what is going to be the impact of the climate change of the different kind of climate variables singing in the in time to the different habitats or species. And I think it's, it's going to be like all integrated in the platform. One of the things that we hope will come out of the tools development is that interested parties like planners, um, like land managers, will be able to use those tools to predict the impact of what they're planning um, and effectively model it against what the curlew need and what other species might need or what the habitats are doing in the future. So yes, those, the tools are intended to, to provide information to exactly those audiences. Brilliant, thank you. Did anyone else? No. Okay, cool. Uh, one more question, and then I think we have to uh, move on. Uh, are you comparing your research with other areas? For example, I live on, on the Lincolnshire coast, and I see overwintering curlew fly a long way inland every morning and back to the coast at dusk. That's really good to hear. Nice. Thank you very much. Sorry, Rachel. <laughs> it's always fun right. to do these things, isn't it? Thank you very much. That's really good to hear that there are you are actually seeing curlews do similar sort of long range movements in. We are, within the BTO, we've got several different projects that are working on curlews. So of course we discuss with those, but we also have collaborations elsewise with whether they're the government agencies or other NGOs such as WWT or RSPB. We're going to be talking to them, but I believe Rachel can talk a bit more about the life project that's coming up. Maybe that might be of interest. Well, the, I mean, the life project is focused on breeding birds. So again, it's it's a little bit different from from what Echoes is doing. Um, but what I will say is that the, the suite of tools that uh, that we're producing and that Walter has been talking about how those how those tools are being generated those are actually intended to operate anywhere. So the climate models cover all of the UK. The, the tools that we're working with um, are intended mainly to use remote sense data that can be available anywhere that doesn't require the, the ground truthing. And the, the habitat and behavior models that will come out of the tracking work should be portable. They should be things that a site manager anywhere, um, at least 
anywhere with similar habitat types um, should be able to use to look at their site. So we're, we're trying to make the outputs of the project transferable to other places. Obviously, the Lincolnshire coast, um, some of it I know quite well, um, is structurally a little bit different. It tends to be rather flatter um, than, than certainly than the Welsh coast. Um, but it's interesting that the curlew are using relatively flat bits of Anglesey, certainly. Um, so, yes, the intention is that you should be able to use the tools in Lincolnshire if you want to and see whether the distribution of the birds looks like the predicted distribution coming out of the tool suite. Um, interestingly, the daytime and nighttime birds do seem to behave differently, but it's more strongly, it looks like it's going to be more strongly um, driven by the tide than by um, day and night. Okay, great. Um, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to just email them to us uh, and, and we will answer them that way. Right, uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen again. Let's see. All right, I believe you can see my screen now. Uh, just moving on. Right, so I'm going to move on to the drawing competition. In the past few weeks, we have been running a drawing competition for children along the Irish Sea coastlines, focusing on World Curlew Day, of course. It's the first time that we have done this, and I was a bit worried about not getting enough entries, but we've had a wonderful amount of drawings sent to us. So thank you so much to all the children who took part. Um, all the drawings have been fabulous, so this has been a very tricky one to judge. Now we have divided the winners into two age categories, six to eight years old and nine to 11 years old. Um, and there are two winners in each country. So if we start with the six to eight year old category, our winner in Ireland is Fansha, who's eight years old. And we love the movement in this drawing. It's a windy day on the estuary and the curlew is strutting around looking for food and Fansha has captured its speckled plumage very well as well. So congratulations, Fansha. Our second winner in the six to eight years category is Otto, who's six years old. And this drawing just made us happy when we saw it because there's so much originality in there. Just look at the details of the wingtips and the beak. And it's obviously eating something tasty. And you can see that it's wading around in the shallow water. So it's a real beauty. Thank you so much, Otto. And uh, we're moving on now to the nine to 11 year old category. And the winner in Ireland is Benen, who's nine years old. And uh, yeah, we just love the sunbeam adding warmth to this picture and the movement in the grass and in the sky. And um, Benin has captured the long legs well too. So well done, Benin. Uh, and we're moving on to our final winner in the nine to 11 years category. And that is Christian, who's 11 years old. Uh, this one has a lovely composition to it with the hills in the background and the the reeds in the foreground and it's just the right habitat for the curlew and uh, this drawing obviously has a, a high level of professional quality too so congratulations Christian well done all of you. Um, all of the winners in this competition will be sent a gift card uh, a gift pack rather with um, no what am I saying a pack with gift cards uh, printed with their own print so thanks again. Right, um, the curlew has been celebrated in art and poetry for centuries. Now recently, a group of poets and musicians in Ireland and Wales have also taken to the curlew theme. And I'm very proud to say that some of their inspiration actually came from the Echoes project. They call themselves Bardair an Choil, and Bardair is Old Welsh for the words of the poet and choil is Irish for music. So it's poetry and music, in other words. Um, these guys are dedicated to collaborating, writing, and performing in their native languages, which is Irish and Welsh. 
All of them are from West Wales and the west of Ireland and all of them live close to the sea. My Maeve um, Neve Viegli, as you can see here, uh, she's part of this group and she has kindly given us, given us permission to play her song, The Curlew's Call. And the poster here next to Maeve is, um, is for their World Curly Day performance, which you can watch this evening at eight o'clock. So you can just go to that link underneath the poster and the gig will be on. You don't need to register beforehand or anything. So I really look forward to doing that this evening. Before I press play, um, I just want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Do keep in touch, follow us on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to our newsletter. And if you want to collaborate or get involved, send us an email and we will happily discuss this more in detail. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Bye for now. Um, this is a song that I wrote about the curly bird, as it is an endangered species. And especially in the chorus, you'd hear the kind of lament feel of the song as we are trying to call the curly back with its own call. Damaganvach am Alwad a Gelfinich. 